Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. We're going to kind of finish off where we were, what we were doing yesterday. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? A dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful, Lord, for all the things you've been doing in our lives, in our studies. Uh, we're thankful for those who have been studying these things. Um, some new people looking at uh, Daniel 11. And we know, Lord, that uh, your spirit always attends the study of your word when it's sought prayerfully uh, for the purpose of revealing to us our need of you. And so we invite your spirit for this purpose. We ask for forgiveness for our sins, that you can use us uh, to reveal your character to the world. Help us to understand these passages, and we pray for one another. And we ask for your angels' care and protection today. In Jesus' name, amen. Yesterday, we we keep looking at the same things, and, and we notice more details. And we, we did, a, well, I would say a thorough examination of verses 23 and 24. We looked at verse 22 as well. But but I'm, I'm a bit more satisfied with what we have done, just as far as uh, the thoroughness of it. So what we have decided at this point is that we can line up uh, the events in these lines with our line. And we have the symbols that do that. So in the history there above, uh, we can look at it in our history. And this ends up being um, this line. Just one of the things we want to look at with the line is, you know, we have a period of darkness and we have a message. Now, the line above, that is about the rise of Rome. The reason that Rome has to arise is that Rome is going to be the power of the nation that crucifies Christ and is uh, going to counterfeit his work, first pagan Rome um, and then papal Rome. And so without the rise of Rome, we don't end up with the papacy, which is going to be there at the end of the world. So, so Rome has to exalt itself to establish the vision. And that's in God's providence, not in Rome's uh, foreknowledge. They're not trying to exalt themselves to establish the vision because they don't know about the vision. They're just exalting themselves. But God allows it because uh, Rome has to be there. Now, when it comes to our line, uh, what is it? What is this darkness and what what are these messages? How do they relate to the line above? That is, you know, we're obviously not particularly dealing with, you know, Rome. I mean, we are dealing with, to some degree, the papacy, but it has to do with this movement. It has to do with what's happening with this league. Right. So this Roman Jewish league in the history of of the Jews with literal Rome, it's going to end in the destruction of Jerusalem. So the reason that, and, and, and it's also the destruction of Jerusalem is the result of the crucifixion of Christ. So they're all connected. That's Daniel 11, or not Daniel 11, Daniel 9, verse uh, 26 and 27. Titus coming in, destroying uh, the city and the sanctuary, Christ being crucified in the midst of the week. And, and he's confirming a covenant with many for one week. Right. So it's in the midst of that covenant week. So in the repeat of history or in the present truth application of this line, what is it that we're seeing that's paralleling as far as the darkness and the message itself? So that's what we would have to to consider. So we can see the darkness in the line above is the darkness in the fact that well, we could we could look at it. This way, it says the Jews failed to realize the prophetic significance of Rome in relation to the Messiah. Right? So Rome is not the nation that the Jews are fighting at this time. They're fighting against uh, Greeks. They're, they're going to make, uh, you know, after like in the Maccabean period, they're going to make a league with Rome, not realizing that Rome is really the enemy. Right? They, they've, they're trying to get uh, from one yoke, the Greek yoke, but they're going to be uh, have another yoke placed upon them. So if we're going to parallel that to 1989, we know first that this is going to be about the United States. It's going to be about the false prophet, about Protestantism. And, and we can see that in 1798, you know, Protestants are going to be tested 
And in that history, the Protestant horn is going to fall. In our history, it's going to be the Republican horn that falls. So we could say, you know, to some degree, when we're looking at 1798 and 1989 as these times of the end, one is the time of the end uh, for the Protestants. The other is the time of the end for the Republicans, for the United States itself, the Republican horn. But when we're comparing this with with, uh, with Rome, it was brought up, you know, that, that there is this transition from Republican Rome to Imperial Rome. And, and that's going to happen in this history. Now, the way that Miller does this is he he doesn't take what secular historians would say. He marks this Roman Jewish League as the beginning of this. Right. So this isn't going to be seen significantly in the eyes of of historians from a from a prophetic position because they don't understand that. But we can see here that the Jews are not understanding the role of Rome. And so they're going to have a league with Rome. And and we could say that of Seventh day Adventists, though I don't know how. But maybe we could say it of, of the United States, that they make this league with Rome because they have a common enemy, which is the king of the south. So in this case, in 1989, if, if we're going to put this period of darkness, it still would be. Would there, though, yeah. wouldn't, wouldn't it be a league for the Seventh-day Adventist church to go kiss the Pope's hand? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you consider that a league? They did that in 1989? I don't know when they did it. I, I, know they, I heard they have. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know if that's actually true, but, you know, because I hear a lot of things that people say about all kinds of stuff, and when I try to find it, I can't find any evidence of it. But, um, you know, if you have that evidence and you have a date for it, that would be an interesting thing to look at. When did the emissary of the Adventist Church present this medal to the Pope? I don't know. I, I know that happened. In order to have an audience with the Pope, I believe it's a requirement that you kiss his ring. Really? Yep. Okay. Are you sure? I'm pretty certain of that. Okay. And what's the what's the evidence? It's just I'm I'm really skeptical about a lot of these things. I understand. I'll, because I'll see what I, I can do. I look these things up all the time and I find no evidence for all kinds of claims that are what we would call you know, urban legends, right? So, so a lot of times people say th different things. And I'm one of those guys that just don't accept anything that just because somebody says it. But sometimes they're right. But I would find the majority of times that things that people have spread around Adventism are just not sometimes like easily proven not true. You know, and, and some of them are just kind of sort of inane little things, you know, like, uh, um, you know, that certain people were, you know, played in other bands, you know, like in certain rock bands, you know, certain people had connections with different things. Uh, I can't remember all the, I think there's like John Osborne or let me see, what's it? Uh, Ozzy Osborne used to be an Adventist or things like that, or different people used to be Adventists. You know, Prince used to be an Adventist, uh, things like that. When you look into them, you know, they're just not true. So there's a lot of a lot of things that go around, and especially a lot of things about the Catholic Church. So I, I'm not, but anyway, it would be interesting to see that information. But I don't think that that's what we're looking at when we're looking at the time at the end here. We're looking at Ephraim. So this is northern Israel, and it's going to make a league, right? And we would we would put that at 1989. Now, its formalization has to do with the Seventh-day Adventist Church, uh, in a sense, being under siege at 9-11, right? So we look at Pompey's siege of Jerusalem. We parallel that with 9-11. And then we have this empowerment, which is Pharsalus in the Battle of Actium. That's what we put up there. And, and we just have that center way mark, 11904, as the empowerment. But, you know, maybe we could have said the Battle of Actium him as the empowerment and the farce list is just part of that structure. I don't know. And then we have the second angel arrive is uh, Christ cross. It's the midst of the week. Now we have the second angel arriving in the present truth line as Jeff's summary, but we have evidence for that based upon the small people 
and the first day of the first month and, and the 193 days, which is 391 in reverse. So the 6,256 days from November 9th, 2001. So, so we have the 391 tied in with that and this symbol for a times, right? A time. So even for a time, 360. So we have this, this parallel. And then we have a formalization of the message. Uh, that's going to be November 9th, which we're lining up with the temple being destroyed in 70 AD. And then we have the second angel arriving is just the 777 days, right? And then we have the third angel arriving, 508. And, and in 508, it's going to be December 25th, the baptism of Clovis. Uh, and here we have December 25th, 2021. And then we have the word even, and that's going to give us the, the June 22nd date with its witnesses. So we have a bunch of things in there that, that we have uh, put together. So all these different symbols dealing with the 391. So just lots of different things in here that, that show that this is about something. So what we're, what we're asking is what is it in this line that's being revealed? Because you have a period of darkness and we say, what is the period of darkness, partic particularly in the present truth line? How does it relate to what's above? So this would be a lack of understanding of prophecy. In 1989. So when the Soviet Union falls, do Adventists have the possibility of knowing that that's a fulfillment of prophecy? When Rome arises, when it exalts itself to establish the vision, shouldn't, and, and there's this league with the Jews, shouldn't the Jews recognize the prophetic role of Rome? So in both cases, we see a parallel. It's, it's a lack of understanding of certain aspects of prophecy. Now, the number of days from 11.9 to 9.11 being 4,324 days. The name Michael, though the feminine form, you know, who is like God, you know, is this challenge. And, and so that means that, that what's being tested is God in, in contrast to something else, right? Which usually is, is Satan. And then we have, you know, the sour grapes, which is going to uh, apply to the generations. And then we even have the brain of the donkey there as a symbol. We have of the 1155 days, which gives us sour grapes, but it also has, you know, 77 times 15. And we know 168 times 77 is 12936, which was my home address as a kid. And 158 minus 15 equals 153. So uh, 153 times 77 is 11,781. And if you compare that to the 391 months, which is 1190 days, you get a difference of 119. So we have the 391, 119. This is all a part of this line. And so primarily what this line would be about is an understanding of the 391 and the significance of 119 and 911. And you can see that that's clearly part of this line. And then the 666 years above is, is connecting us to that 666 years from Miller's prophecy that, that we use to actually understand all of this, right? All of this history. So we have three different periods of 666 years. One, one is an inclusive count. The other two are just cardinal counts. So tying in that December 25th, 2021 with 508 Clovis's baptism on December 25th and 508 is pretty significant. So we, we, we can be assured that these lines make sense exactly where we place the empowerments and fulfillments. Maybe, you know, person could debate some of those exactly, you know, why Jeff's summary is uh, the arrival of a second message. And this second message, of course, is going to relate specifically to the 777 days. That is, the Jeff summary is going to address the 391 and a half days to November 9th, 2019. And in that 777 days, the focus is going to be upon uh, the publication of this prediction, its typical fulfillment with the bombing of Nashville on December 25th, and then the end of that 777 days on December 25th, 2021, where we come to understand the 777 years from 457 to 321, the year in which the Sunday law occurs, the first Sunday law. So, <clears throat> so there's a lot of symbolism 
attached to these lines. And, and we can see that, that they're connected as far as the message. The message, the darkness has to do with a misapprehension of prophecy and the role that it has, especially in our movement in relation to time, what, what role time has. So, so there's a lot, lots here, right? I mean, to go over everything, like all of the information that builds these lines would take quite a while. We have a, lines here with dates. And sometimes, you know, when we have lines, you know, an Adventist can draw lines, you know, with progression of events. But there, these are extremely involved. One of the problems, one of the criticisms that people have against uh, what we've been doing in our studies, you know, ever since 2020, and even, even before in the studies that I presented on chronology, is that it's too complicated. But, you know, the thing that I find interesting um, you know, a friend of mine was sharing uh, with his mom, he's sharing uh, the Daniel 11 paper that we have here in front of us. And, you know, she's not an Adventist. She's done a bit of studying with him. And, you know, start going through this paper, and she's just fascinated by it. But we have people in this movement who can't understand any of this. That is, they're going to just see all of it as, I don't know what they see it as. It doesn't really make much sense. To me, this... This is something if they spent a bit of time looking at it, they should be able to accept it. But they, they're going to reject this as error. They're not going to see anything in it. They're not going to understand the numbers. They're not going to understand the dates. And, and Kelly brought up in uh, the study on the Sabbath, and I've experienced this as well, where when somebody has a closed mind and you try to present some simple idea, such as, well, what's 1260 plus 1260? And that person cannot, for the life of them, see that it's 2520. There has to be, for, for Adventists who are not interested in receiving truth, the problem is not with what we're presenting. The problem is with the mind that has been, you know, closed maybe isn't quite the right word. Maybe sealed is a better word. It, it's, it's sealed from seeing anything that is truth, anything that's going to bring a condemnation upon that person. And we see this in all areas of life. When people are confronted with the same basic facts, one group of people will see nothing, while another, another group of people will see the relationship of the facts to reality. And, and I would have to say it's, it's maybe a better word than a closed mind is, is more spiritual blindness. So these things, even though they're complicated and involved, people can understand these things. These are not impossible things to understand. Now, you're always going to understand them on a deeper level. But the really simple idea here is that we have a symbol, even for a time, and a time representing 360 years. And we have two periods of them. And they yield all of these different symbols with the Hebrew numbers. And then we can take the actual number, Hebrew number 6256, and place it in our history. And it's going to yield this structure. And so there's no way that we cannot, whether we, we argue about exactly where to put some of the, uh, the way marks, it's pretty obvious that these are the same history. One is, of course, real history in the past. And the other one is history in the present. A any thoughts on that? So hopefully that's, you know, understood enough. Now we began looking at verse 25 a little while ago, and then we went back to verse 23 and 24. And, and one of the reasons we went back is we said, well, we're going to have a hard time moving ahead if we don't really have 23 and 24 nailed down and, and some of the earlier verses. There. So we, so we did some review. So now we should be able to look at this a bit more. It should be a little bit more fresh and it should be a little bit more clear. So it should be both. We, we, we have some foundation laid there. Now, this is going to cover a history that's already covered, right? So this is going to deal with Octavian. And, and that's going to be covered, you know, back in this history in verses 19 to 22. It actually starts, starts earlier, but specifically dealing with Augustus. So Augustus is Octavian, Octavius, he's also called, and his name's actually the same name as Julius Caesar. 
So they, they actually have the same name. But, you know, we, we call them Augustus or Octavian just so that we don't get them confused. So Gaius, Julius Caesar, something like that. So why do why is there this repeat and enlarge? We know there's the repeat and enlarge going back for the league. And so then they're going to repeat this history with Augustus, with Octavian. Why? Because what what is this going to address that we had dealt with earlier? We deal with it here, right? It says he shall forecast his devices against or from the strongholds even for a time. So what is this going to address? Why are they going through this history? Because they're, they're gonna they're gonna bring us up, you know, to the destruction of Jerusalem and the diaspora, right? Which is a result of this league. But now they're gonna go back and they're gonna go back to Augustus. So why are they going back there? This this is really important in understanding Daniel chapter eleven. This is really one of the things that people why people don't understand Daniel eleven, like from an intellectual point of view is they expect Daniel 11 to be chronological. Same problem in the book of Revelation. Same thing when they read Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3 or whatever. People always think that the story is going to run, everything's going to be consecutive. But that's not how the Jews write. Isn't this establishing a parallel line? Okay, well, it establishes parallel lines. So that means, you know, the reason why there's a repeat and enlarge, in a sense, right from the beginning of the Bible, you have this idea that something is presented and then you're going to repeat and enlarge and repeat and enlarge is just a zoom into some away mark. Right. Agreed. OK, so so this happens all the time through scripture. So now they just introduce this, this even for a time and it's going to start with the Battle of Actium. Right. And so they're going to give the background now for the Battle of Actium. Right. They're going to zoom into a way mark that we have on this line above. They're going to zoom into the Battle of Actium, right? So this this one right here. So verses 23 and 24, they went back, they zoomed in, and they they went from this league all the way to uh, Constantine, um, and then uh, and then to Clovis, right? So they went to you know Constantinople, and then and then to Clovis. So they they dealt with this this history of Rome going from Rome pagan. Uh, to Rome Papal that's going to be setting that up that 30 years. Then the next part is they, they have to actually explain Actium, right? They have to explain this starting point uh, that we have here. So we have a pagan Rome now is the king of the north. So when it says he, uh, the king of the north, we put in there, but he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south. So that means it's obviously the king of the north against the king of the south. But this is no longer Greece, where most commentators are, are they're going to say that this is still Greece. You know, when he shall stir up his power and courage against the king of the south, they're going to be looking at this stuff, dealing with Antiochus Epiphanes and, and all that kind of stuff. But we know that this is now Rome, because Rome has exalted itself to establish the vision. And we have this all these lines that show this is Rome and that this is going to be addressing the Battle of Actium. So obviously, if you believe that this is regarding, you know, Antiochus Epiphanes, then you're not going to have this as the Battle of Actium. You're going to have this all back, all of this, the time of the end, they're going to have, you know, like in that history of the Maccabees, right? So I'm dis- discussing this with a guy right now on uh, my academia site. So in looking at, at this, when we have pagan Rome as the king of the north, he stirs up his power and courage against the king of the south. So this is going to be Rome coming against Egypt not Greece coming against Egypt, not, you know, the, the, Seleuc- uh, the um, Seleucid Empire coming against the Ptolemaic Empire. And so then we're going to have, uh, you know, Antony in here um, and Octavian, right? So there's going to be this battle between them. And then it's, uh, and then it's going to talk, for they shall forecast the vices against him. So, that ties us back to verse 24, where they shall forecast their devices against the strongholds, even for a time. Right. So so we have this forecasting of devices mentioned again. And then it talks about the feed, the portion of his meat I shall destroy him. Um, you know, I was thinking about this a little bit. So what ends up happening is the way that this battle of Actium is fought, the way that it's won by by Octavian is 
Antony and Cleopatra, they're going to go to, to Actium, right? So they're going to, they're going to go to Greece and they're going to set up, you know, their army and their fleet, but they're getting their supplies from Egypt. That is their, their meat, their grain is coming from, from Egypt. So we have here, Rome is dependent upon Egypt for grain, but, but I really think it's not so much Rome is dependent. Uh, this has to do with the fact that the ones that are feeding the king of the king of the south here, which is going to be uh, Antony, is is Egypt, right? And they're they're going to cut off the supplies. Now, what this does is it forces uh, Antony and Cleopatra to go to battle on the sea at a time when they're not ready for it. So they they wanted to you know set up this fortification or whatever, and and draw. Octavian into battle, but instead, because their their food supply was cut off and their army was starving, uh, they were forced into battle. So that's what I think is is here. So uh, so instead of Rome is dependent, I'm going to put here Antony. So we had a discussion about this before with with Stephen, and and so I thought about it a little bit, and and I studied some of the history. So this is what ends up happening. So I probably have to go back because I know not everybody's going to understand all this. So if we say, and he, the king of the north, right? So this is, this is not just pagan Rome. It is, but we say it's the USA and the papacy in the present truth application. I mean, this would basically be pagan Rome under Octavian, right? Agreed. So Octavian, I mean, in a sense, he's Rome. I mean, Antony, he has his alliances with Egypt, right? So he's, he ends up being the king of the south. So that we can see that Antony's the king of the south and Octavian's the king of the north. Now he stirs up his power and his courage. Now, why does it have his power and his courage? These, these words aren't put here haphazardly. They have purposes. So we have to consider what this might mean. Okay, so what would we do to try to understand what this means? He stirs up his power and his courage. So we got a, a word koach, which means literally force in a good or a bad sense. Capacity means it also refers to a large lizard. Um, ability, chameleon, force, fruits, might, power, strength, substance, wealth. And then courage, uh, the heart. So this is the word labab. We looked at that before. That it's actually an onomatopoeic word in Hebrew, because that's what your heart does, labab, 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 right? So that's just the sound of the heart. Now, it, it can mean courage. It can mean uh, themselves. Uh, comfortably, it's translated in different ways like that. I, I'm just looking at my um, Bible dictionary there, and it's taking a moment. So this word courage, so the inner man, the mind, the will, the heart, the soul, the understanding. It has lots of different applications, the word heart. And it occurs tons of times in the Bible, obviously. So 249 times, 211 times it's translated as heart, uh, 22 times as hearts, four times as mind, three as understanding, faint-hearted twice, unawares twice, right? and a few other ones. But courage, the only place they translate it as courage is Daniel 11, verse 25. So he's going to stir up his power and his heart against the king of the south, which is going to be Mark Antony, with a great army. Okay, any any thoughts on this power and courage? Why, why do we have to have these two words here? Why can he just stir up his power against the king of the south? Why does he have to stir up his power and his courage? And his heart. And again, with power, strength, power, might. So we got military power and courage. What is, what, what would that, what kind of power is that? Isn't Octavian at that time the younger of the two combatants? Well, I, I think so. I think he's younger than Antony, but, uh, so he's pretty that, young. At that point, is he going to have the military experience that Antony had? Well, no, but and I understand what you're saying, but it's not really the question I'm asking. I'm not asking right. from a practical point of view. I'm asking more from a symbolic point of view. But yeah, I, I mean, obviously he's had and, and the word stirred up 
has to do with an opening of the eyes to arouse oneself, to waken. Isn't this the point where Octavian began to realize just how far reaching his power could become? Well, yes, I, I think that would be true. But you're, you're still thinking more practically. I'm trying to think more symbolically. So I'm trying to combine the two. So, okay. yeah. So he's got his power and his courage. And that's a period. So if we took the word uh, power, it's a period of nine years and 10 months, biblically, and courage. And this is going to be about 10 years and five months, not quite five months. And depends how you count it. 171 and a half days. So one's 10 years, 171 and a half days. The other one's nine years, 293 and a quarter. So it's uh, together there, 20 years and um, 100 days. So if I put those together, three, five, eight, one plus three, two, four. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, so they're exactly 20 years and 100 days. So you know, the question is, where could we put 20 years and 100 days in our lines that would have significance? And and we have to think about, we haven't really even decided where this line starts. I mean, we have the USA and the papacy there. And, and the idea is that this is going to go back to 1989. But if we're going to put, you know, 20 years and, and this word stir up, we, we should also look at where this word occurs. And it occurs a lot, of course. Um, this waking up lots of times in the Bible, 80 times. We have it in Daniel 11, verse 2, where it talks about, um, and now I will show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the four shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grisha. Okay, so we have the stir up there. And, and you're going to have two things as well. You're going to have strength, which is a different word. It's not, it means prevailing power. Hezka, 2393. And riches, 6239, referring to wealth. So that was, you know, dealing with, with the history of Persia. And then you have it again in verse 25, as we've read. I'm just seeing if there's other verses that look significant. It's also in Ezra 1, 1. Now, the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, that the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus. So, again, that's the idea of being wakened up, to have his eyes opened. So, now you're using this idea that Octavian's eyes are going to be opened as far as the potential for Rome, for his power personally, but maybe also for Rome in particular. Right. Okay. So if we're going to put that there with the king of the north, the United States and the papacy, is this having to do with what's happening with the Soviet Union, that they, they become aware that there is this opportunity to come against the USSR? That's possible. Yeah. So one of the things that, that I'm, I'm saying about this is we can definitely see this is Daniel 11, verse 40B, right? Okay. So that's that's the way that I understand it. This is uh, in Daniel 11, verse 40, you're going to have, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen and many ships, and he shall enter into the country, he shall overflow and pass over. You're going to have that overflowing and passing over that we had earlier. And the other one where we tied it up to 1989 and the Sunday law and all those things. So here we're saying that this is, This is 1989. So this is the history of the Sunday law. But it's first going to be the king of the north having to defeat the king of the south. Right? Because the king of the south pushed at him. Right now the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. So this is the same history. Now, you know, when I add those two numbers together, I mean, we get we get a period of 20 years and 100 days. But I could also add those two words together to create another Hebrew word. The first place that this this number, so that's going to be, if you add them together in uh, verse 25, you're going to add power and courage. So let me see. What did I do here? So power is, so it's going to be seven 7,405 is going to be the number. 
And if I look up that number here, I should show you what I do. So I'm just going to look at here in this word, it's the King James Concordance. And, and it first shows up in Exodus 28, 28. So is that important that it shows up in a verse that's doubled as 28? What does that mean when we see a verse that's doubled? And especially 28. What is 28? Is that four seven times? Yeah. So seven times four. So, okay. Now it says, now this is just dealing with the ephod. They shall bind the breastplate by the rings thereof unto the rings of the ephod with a lace of blue that it may be above the curious girdle of the ephod and that the breastplate be not loosed from the ephod. So it's the word bind. So what is this verse symbolizing? What is the ephod for? Hearing the word of the Lord. Okay, more. So they have this this breastplate. So right. okay. So what what specifically is the ephod? And, and what's the breastplate? So you got an ephod. What is an ephod? If you look at the verse. Ain't that the um? Ain't that where the um the ephod is where the um sin the um the. Uh, I don't know what you mean. The uh, smoke of the prayers of the saints. No, no. This is the the linen apron worn by the priest. It's part of his garment, and the ephod is going to have a breastplate on it. So this is kind of like an apron. So the purpose of the ephod has to do with the, uh, they say here, uh, the oracular practices of and priestly ritual. So it has to do with oracles, right? So you're going to have the ephod, and the ephod has a breastplate on it. And you're going to have the urim and the thummim on those, those different stones that are going to be used for making decisions. Okay, so this this is binding the breastplate to the ephod. So the breastplate itself, what's what's the breastplate have on it? What what it's got the, it's got the stones. It had, okay, it stones it are it representative stones. of stones. And they're representative of children of Israel by name. Okay, so all of the twelve tribes of Israel, and they're placed upon the heart of our high priest, right? Right. Okay. And they're going to be bound uh, to this ephod. So, so what is this symbolizing? We, we have we have the idea here that we saw with um, uh, these two words, courage and um, power. And the one courage means heart, and, and the power is strength. So, strength of heart. And we see here that we can have this ephod that has this breastplate, which has each of the twelve tribes of Israel being bound to the heart of the high priest. Is that making sense to people? Seems to. Seems it's to be. logical. Okay. So if we look at Daniel 11, verse 25 again, and we think about that this is the stirring up of his power and courage against the king of the south. This is, of course, the king of the north. This is going to be Octavian. But we can see in that power of courage that this is something that binds. And the only time that it's used is the binding of the breastplate to the ephod. And with the ephod, we could say that this is, that this is, um, so obviously the breastplate could refer to in reference to tying this to the heart. And we could look at, at, at the word, other words for bind, but this is the only place that that word bind is used is binding the breastplate to the ephod, 7405. I should look that up again as far as, so if I go to 7405 again. Just to show you this, it's it's going to be used also in uh, 3921, but it's going to be the same thing. They did bind the breastplate by his rings onto the rings of the ephod. And then when we look up the word itself, it just says it's it's um, a primitive root, right? It's not from some other word, rakas, bind. So we don't have this anywhere else that we can compare it to, not in another form or anything. It's just that word's a standalone word only used in the context of the breastplate to the ephod. So if we're going to put this to 1989, we're going to just take that word bind. This is binding of power, which is, again, this, this word power, human strength, the strength of angels, the power of God, the strength of animals. So strength and courage are together, are bound. So if we're going to, we're going to place this here, 
This is, of course, not the power of God or the courage of God directly, right? But this is in God's providence that the king of the south is going to be defeated, right? Because prophetically, the king of the north needs to defeat the king of the south. So I just think it's interesting that we we can take that. Now, also about the period of 20 years and 100 days. So is there any place that we can place that? Usually we'd look at something like 9-11, you know, go from 9-11. It's going to bring us to, you know, to our history. So if we do 7, 7 4, 0, 5. That brings us to December 20th, 2021. So five days short of December 25th. I did that right. So 7, 4, 0, 5. So that means from September 11th, 2001 to December 25th, uh, 2021 is a period of 7,410 days, which I have here in my chart. So that's going to be five days short, which is kind of interesting. That is uh, this binding of power and courage, you know, to make the word bind. And so we're binding them together to get the word bind. We're saying that power and courage, power represents the ephod. Courage represents the best breastplate. You bind them together and you, you get to December 20th, 2021 from 9-11. Is that significant that we're five days short? It could be. <laughs> okay. I mean, it, it's pretty close. I mean, if it was, you know, exactly that number of days, we would have just accepted it. But it's, it's going to be five days short. So, so maybe that's not the place to place it. Now we do have, if we go back to 1979, when does that the Soviet Afghan war begin? Was it December 24th? I'm trying to remember because we had a date for it. December 25th, 1979. December 24th, 79. Okay. Okay. You're right. So December 24th, 79. So I'm just going to see where that goes. Okay, so that brings us to the year 2000. So it's uh, April 2nd, 2000, the 26th day of the 12th month. So it, d- it doesn't bring us to 9-11 or anything like that. Now, we had other dates, I believe, that we could have looked at. But for now, I'm not going to try to go through every single date to figure out where we could put 20 years and 100 days. Now, another place we, we could put it, of course, is... You know, if you go from 2001, we'll see here. So, uh, 2012, what was the other date we had? I'm trying to think. Yeah, so, so, I mean, the, the significant one is it gets us five days short of December 25th, 2021. And, and five days short of that, I mean, it's, it's a symbol of, you know, the foolish and the wise. There's going to be a division in the movement there. So I'm not sure exactly, but, I just wouldn't discount it just because it's five days short. That's kind of a significant symbol. I'm just looking at some of these numbers here. I'm going to have to think about some of these numbers a bit more. Now, now we're also going to have another word stirred up. They're going to be stirred up to battle. The king of the south shall be stirred up to battle. So we have uh, the king of the north, Octavian, he's being stirred up. His eyes are being opened. And he's going to bring his power and his strength, which together, bound together, means the word bind against the king of the south and it's going to be with a great army and that word great is gadol and the word army just means probably force army wealth virtue valor strength it could be lots of different things and then the king of the south shall be stirred up and that word stirred up means to be stirred up in anger so even though they're both stirred up it's completely different types of meanings so one is to to be angry The other one is just to wake up, okay? So he's stirred up, that is Antony, being in the south, stirred up to battle. Um, So this is a military engagement, and that's called milchama, is the Hebrew word, milchama. And with a very great and mighty army. So it seems like this the army of the king of the south should defeat the king of the north. Now, um, we have here... So if you look at some of these words, very is actually two different words. So it's it has to do with vehemence and uh, which is the three nine six six vehemently. And then the thing about very, what do we notice about the word very five seven zero four? And and it's a, a preposition to an adverb or a conjunction to conjugation. 
especially with the preposition as far or long. So, so this would be uh, with a large amount of vehemence. And then it's going to have this word gadol again, and then mighty at some 6099. Now, if you go back to this five, five, seven, zero, four, the thing that I, I notice is it has the same digits as uh, seven, four, zero, five that we had when we added power and courage together. So I don't know if that's just a coincidence or if it just shows that this is in response to this power and courage, he's going to be stirred up to battle with this word 5704. Very, very great. And then he's going to have me'od, great, vehemence. But he shall not stand. So that word stand, we know that that that's, shows up all through this Daniel 11. And, and the idea of standing here, the, the way that I understand this as a symbol is the kingdoms that stand are the kingdoms of Bible prophecy in, in the context of Daniel, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Does Egypt stand in this history? I don't think so. Not, not as the kingdom of Bible prophecy. So it, it's not going to be able to stand because Rome is the kingdom that ultimately will stand. Now it says, but he shall not stand, for they shall forecast devices against him. So the they that forecast devices, we know that Rome forecasts his devices against the strongholds or from the stronghold. So it's Rome that forecasts devices. Now, this idea of forecasting devices, it, it means literally uh, to plate or interpenetrate, that is weave. So this would be a sort of type of infiltration right that's another way to look at it right so this has a lot to do with conceiving considering counting cunning devise esteem find out forecast hold imagine impute invent be like mean purpose reckon regard think right fabricate plot so this is how rome works and uh, the devices we remember this is just a contrivance a machinery so this is the roman machinery at work that's going to defeat the king of the south. And then it says, yea, they that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him and his army shall overflow and many shall fall down slain. Now we already had uh, this idea. So dealing with this, that they that feed the portion of his meat, right? We said this is, this is Egypt and his meat here must be not Rome's meat, but Antony's meat. That is the food. But it says he that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him. So what yeah. happened to Antony? Then Antony's army abandoned him. Yes. <laughs> and, and then it says his army shall overflow and many shall fall down slain. And then it says both these kings hearts shall be to do mischief and they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper for the yet the end shall be at the time appointed. Now this is talking about the battle of Actium. But prior to the Battle of Actium, did both these kings speak lies at one table? Is that what it's speaking of? You're that way. Looks like that way, yeah. Okay. So, again, it's not in order, right? They're going to go to the Battle of Actium in which Antony is going to be defeated, and, and his army shall destroy him, and his army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. So I'm not sure, you know, when it says his army here, uh, whether that's the army of the king of the north and king of the south, we'd have to discuss that. But it says, and both these kings' hearts, so again, you have that word, labab, shall be to do mischief, and mischief is wickedness. And they shall speak, that's the word debar, lies, 3577, that's falsehood, that's just lies at one table, had, and table is 7979. Bulkan, the table spread out by implication a meal. So they're going to fellowship together, but they're going to lie to one another. Uh, but it shall not prosper. Prosper, uh, salah means to push forward. For yet the end shall be at the appointed time. So we'd have to understand what this means. Okay. So verse 25 to 27 has a lot of things that we you know we've studied this in the past, but we have to make sure that we're applying this correctly. So we still have, have more verses to do as well, but um, let's go back to this document. <clears throat> so we put in, in our line, we said, you know, Antony is dependent upon Egypt for grain. 
shall destroy him. His army shall destroy him. So they that feed on the portion of his meat. So we probably should put Antony's army, is dependent upon Egypt for grain, shall destroy him, Antony. And then we put his, Octavian's army, shall overflow, right, which makes sense. And many shall fall down slain. Antony's army and navy will be defeated. And that all makes sense. Okay, so I, I, don't, I think as far as the historical interpretation there, that makes sense. We have, I'm just going to put a footnote regarding power and courage. I don't know how to do this. So power and courage. So, yes, I need to put the Hebrew numbers in there. H3581, courage, H3 column. So I just wanted that footnote in there to remind me I might forget. So you bind those together, you get the word bind. So the king of the south, so Egypt under Antony, the king of the south, Antony, shall be stirred up. And so this here, here is to anger, to battle with a very great and mighty army. But he, Antony, shall not stand. And Octavia defeated him in the Battle of Actium in 31 BC. For they shall forecast devices against him. So that has to do with this plotting, right? And yea, they that feed of the portion of his meat, Antony's army, it's dependent upon Egypt for grain, shall destroy him, Antony, and his Octavian's army shall overflow, and many shall fall down, slain. And both these kings, Octavian and Antony's hearts, shall be to do mischief. They both would both desire to control control of the Roman world. And they speak lies at one table. They form false alliances, but it shall not prosper. These agreements would last for, yet the end shall be for the time appointed. So Antony would be defeated in 31 BC and commit suicide. And then shall he, Octavian, later Caesar Augustus, return into his land with great riches, wealth of Egypt, and his pagan Roman Rome's Octavian's heart shall be against the Holy Covenant. Christianity, and he shall do exploits, persecute Christians, settle the eastern territories, and return to his own land, Rome. Now, now this doesn't really make sense. So, you know, so with Caesar Augustus, do we have him persecuting Christians? I don't think we've addressed that. No, because Octavian dies what year? Isn't it 14 BC or 14 AD? Yeah, so 14 AD. So there wouldn't be any Christians. So obviously, it can't be Octavian. So if we're going to have he shall do he shall do uh, and return to his own land, Rome. Obviously, this can't be persecuting Christians and settling the eastern territories. Now, I think this might be left over from Swearingen's uh, outline. So we have to look at that. It just takes me a second to do a search here. I'm not sure what I got here. Seeing if he says this in his, yeah. So this is what he does. So I'm not sure why he has Augustus persecuting Christians. So it doesn't really make any sense to me. <clears throat> so we're, we're, we're going to have to try to understand this a little better, right? So we definitely can't have this. Well, would so. the Jews, would the Jews then, because they in contact with the Jews, I think. Yeah, there's Jews, but no Christians. There's no Christians before, in, in the time of Augustus. He dies in 14 AD. Right. It's going to be Tiberius who's, uh, you know, the king when Christ is crucified. And it's going to be Nero who first persecutes Christians. So it doesn't really make any sense. And and so if you're going to say that Octavian is the one who's against the Holy Covenant, it doesn't really make any sense. It can't be Octavian. So, I mean, obviously it can be Rome, but he puts, Swearingen says, then shall he Octavian, later Caesar Augustus. Return into his land, Rome, with great riches, wealth of Egypt, and his pagan Rome's Octavian's heart shall be against the Holy Covenant, Christianity, which it can't be because it doesn't exist. Okay, so so that's where I have the problem here. So there's we can't just have Octavian here. I, I mean, we can't we can have Octavian, but we can't have him to be against the Holy Covenant. We'd have to have some way in which that is. It definitely can't be the persecution of Christians. Okay, that makes sense? Uh, yes. So Antony is defeated. Then it says, shall he, Octavian, later Caesar Augustus, 
return into his land with great riches. And he is pagan Rome, pagan Rome's Octavian's heart shall be against the Holy Covenant. So we have to figure out what, if this is Octavian, how is Octavian's heart against the Holy Covenant? That's what we would have to understand historically. How would we show that? And then he shall do and return to his own land. And then at the time appointed, he, pagan Rome. So one of the things I would say is that we're not going to say that this is Octavian. That's the way that I would change this. I wouldn't say when it says, then shall he, I would just say, this is pagan Rome. What's that? Yeah, you're right. Uh, The empire, not the individual, right? Right. Now, saying that Rome is going to return, or or we could, if we, if we said this was Octavian, uh, so if we said this was Octavian and he returns to his own land, if you're going to say, and his heart, this would just have to be pagan Rome's, wouldn't be Octavian's heart. No, if you're going to say his heart shall be against the Holy Covenant, that could, that would just be talking about Rome in general, not Octavian in particular. So it, it can be referring to what happens later. And then that he shall do, I'm not, I'm not happy with persecute Christians, settle the Eastern territories. I'm not even sure that that's, that makes sense in the context here. So he shall do, we need to figure out what that is. Because he's dealing with Octavian, and, and Octavian doesn't persecute Christians, and, and I don't quite understand uh, how you can just get that from it. So he shall do. Now this, he shall do, we had it before. And what was this he shall do about? The last time was he shall do according to his will. Last time. I'm... Okay. And, right. So, I mean, it's a pretty common word. So it's, it's not like something that's unusual. And we had it in Daniel chapter 11, right? So we had it, and you're talking about do according to his will. That was um, Daniel 11 verse 3, referring to uh, Alexander the Great. And But we also applied it to God. Thus shall he do, and he shall give him the daughter of women. And we said, well, that wasn't referring to, you know, Julius Caesar in this case. It was actually referring uh, to God. And now we have that same word uh, in Daniel 11, verse 24. And, it, and it's in, um, so he shall give him the daughter of women, women. Let me see here. So we have it in verse 16. He shall do according to his own will. Um, but when we say, thus shall he do, and he shall give him the daughter of women, we're not applying it. So, so it, I mean, it's a really common word. So lots of people can do. It's not something that's particular to, uh, you know, Roman or Greek or it's not uh, just about kings and and exploits doesn't really make much sense it's just an added word you know trying to make it I guess more English so anyway he's going to do so why does it it say this so he shall do and return to his own land his heart shall be turned shall be against the holy covenant and he shall do and return into his own land then it says at the time appointed he shall return. So this word return is shu. He shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as at the latter. For the ships of Kittim shall come against him. Therefore, he shall be grieved and return. Again, the word return, shu, and have indignation against the holy covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. So, this, this is pretty interesting. I, I think that we need to, to understand what's happening here. And we know this is where we're going to begin moving from Rome to Papal Rome. Right? When we deal with the ships of Kitten, uh, what is that referring to? What history? That's uh, 533. Uh, That's the band. Uh Should I say 533? Well, well, yeah, it's in that history of the fall of the Roman Empire. Yes, right? yes. So, so it, it, it actually covers a, a bit more history than that. Um, but that's where we place that. So the ships of Kittim. So this is going to be re- re- referring to later. So one of the things that we have with this is we're going to have this overflowing, right, of this. And, and we know that there's going to be, it's going to mention uh, this holy covenant. So it's going to, it's going to say it shall be, he, his heart shall be against the holy covenant. So you got the overflowing, 
He shall speak lies at one table. He shall return into his land with great riches. His heart shall be against the holy covenant. He shall do and return to his own land. And at the time appointed, he shall return, again that return, and come toward the south. But it shall not be as the former or as the latter. For the ships of Kittim shall come against him. Therefore, he shall be grieved and returned and have indignation against the holy covenant. So shall he do. And he shall return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. So you have a group that forsakes the holy covenant. So we can see that this is the transition from pagan Rome to papal Rome, right? From paganism. The the ships of, What's that? Doesn't the ships, doesn't the ships of uh, Kittim come from northern Africa areas? Yes, the Andes. And uh, that's Justinian who is uh, grieved. Islam, okay. Yeah, not, not, not Islam. Well, well, Kittim refers to the islands in the Mediterranean uh, along the south part of the Mediterranean, is my understanding. Yes, the Vandals. Yeah, the Vandals. Yeah. Okay. 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 So, yeah, we're going to look at this tomorrow. This starts to make more sense now as we go through this. Okay. Well, let's uh, close with prayer. The dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning and for each person who has participated those that are watching and considering these things, even if it's later on, on watching it on YouTube, we just pray, Lord, that you can bless them. Bring us together again to study your word according to thy will. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.